imagining the mining industry. It sounds lofty. What's it mean to you? What, so what, what should the mining in industry look like? So th I think it means a lot to me. And, and uh, you know, just sitting there listening to the minister right now, you know, we need to advocate for mining. And this is probably the first time I've seen a country reaching out to the mining industry to start and encourage a partnership. Because, hmm. and so I really, you know, it's a great uh, first step because mining is so important to everyday life, all of us. I always say, if you take away everything that comes from mining, it would be a bit airy in here, or rather warm. And, uh, and it's not a big part of, our, of the economy, um, but definitely it's in a very important part of everyday life, mining. And it needs that partnership. And I think reimagining mining is such an interesting topic because it means we need to start again. And I do believe we need to start again. We need to, as miners, reach out and recognize we have stakeholders, not only shareholders who are important, but equally important to our host countries, the communities around our mines, the population in the countries we, we work in. So lots to do. And then, of course, it's the responsibility of all the letters in ESG, not only the environment. But this S part, I think we've got to make the S part a capital, a big capital. Um, and then the G part is all about being transparent. And I think an important factor in that is advocating what mining does for the world. Well, since you brought up the S, let's, let's go there because S stands for the social in ESG. Um, you know, certainly it was a big topic, wasn't it? Uh, all the societal issues on the back of COVID, particularly in 2020. Uh, it still is, obviously, though you could argue, I guess, that the environment became a big issue, particularly uh, towards the end of last year. So what did we learn about uh, so the social and, and mining on the, on the back of, of COVID? So we learned a lot. First of all, if we just top at e, e the E part, yeah. and, uh, and the, um, the C part, but, um, you know, we, we saw how the world managed COVID. It wasn't a very good job. Mm. Uh, everyone looking internally, protecting their own turf, not appreciating the importance, um, the importance of working together in a global sense. And I think that's the other part we've got to be careful about when we focus in on the environment. And that is that the environment cannot be controlled by the three major centers, the, the three major uh, regional economic groups in the world, the big polluters. We've got to worry about how we bring the rest of humankind with us. And right now, what if you listen to all the pundits on the environment obsession and compliance, is no one's thinking about the developing world. And that's the S part. Poverty is as, as big a threat to the future of this planet as is us uh, con constantly destroying the actual environment in which we live. So let's move from the S to the E. Um, you started there doing that. Where do you see mining fitting into the energy transition? Well, we, we play such an important part in the energy transition, and I think, Ryan, you, make, you really touch on it. It's a transition. It's not a stop and start. We have, a, there's a massive responsibility to coordinate the transition across the world and not deny the developing parts of our world to continue to develop. And to do that, you need metals. You need minerals. For the, the interim, you need, um, you need the hydrocarbons. You need to do it responsibly. We've got to worry about the technology we need because right now, in a broad sense, 
there's a lot of promises out there with very few plans. And we need that plan. We need the, to develop technology. And of course, the metals are critical for that. Metals and power are the drivers of advancement and development. Back in uh, 1990, if I'm not mistaken, you graduated, you were doing your uh, PhD in platinum. One of the things we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days is what are the, the minerals that are going to drive the future economy. So then Mark Bristow in, in 1990 was focused on platinum and then of course gold. If you could do it all over again, knowing what you, we now know about the global economy and this, this shift to a, a greener economy and the transition, what would you focus on now? Where do you think the exciting minerals are? So that's a very intriguing question. Um, first of all, I just want to say, we can't do any of this if we don't invest in our young people and in the engineering components of professions. And we need to develop that. And we need, a, we need as all of us, mining governments, to invest in the future uh, generations. To answer your question specifically, so, you know, the other thing, of course, if you listen to the market, you want to be in lithium, zinc, uh, all the precious metals, cobalt, but there's, an, there's a twist to that, and that is, we all know, although we don't want to accept it, the battery technology today is not the battery technology we need to store power to achieve our ultimate goal of net zero emissions. So it's, it's not going to get us there. Sorry? The, the batteries of today aren't going to get they us are, there. They, you know, we look, I mean, you know, the, the EV cars, they can manage. You've got lots of little batteries that make up one battery. Barrick has invested in battery technology to support its microgrids, but it's still a lot of little batteries making a big 10 megawatt battery. So there's a lot of technology that's still got to develop. Same with hydrogen uh, energy. We've got to, you know, we can, conceptually you can do it, but the big problem is storage and how you can actually deliver that. And how do you create the hydrogen in the first place? So then I would say, but, so of course, first of all, any, any geologist that's a good geologist can transport. I started in base metals and ended up in gold. So um, the second thing I would say is, Copper is such a strategic metal. So if I was starting my career today and it broadly um, straddles all the metals as far as geological discovery, development, processing, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's, uh, so I think I'm a, you know, I just think that copper is a really strategic uh, uh, metal no matter what the future is or your scenario you paint for the future. You heard it here first, buy copper. Mark Bristow recommending you buy copper. And of course gold, right? So let me let you talk your own book now, right? Where does gold, um, Barrick Gold, obviously heavily invested in gold. Gold isn't going anywhere. Where does it fit in the future of the global economy? Yeah, it's, a, it's absolutely the only real store of value. Um, you can't print it, it's a currency. You, you know, unlike everyone claims with crypto. Yeah, you know, I thought you were going to say can, Bitcoin. You can, I'll just answer it because I know you'll answer the, ask the question. <laughs> um, crypto, you know, people used to say it was unique, but how many, you can make, create cryptocurrencies and they're coming a dime a dozen at the moment. And so, and, and gold brings special things to developing countries because you can develop it with a lot, of, a lot less infrastructure than some of the big uh, bulk commodities. And, uh, and, and if we are honorable and, and committed to real stakeholder involvement, uh, gold drives a lot of economic change and upliftment across the globe when there are no other businesses. And since we got on to gold, we can't talk about gold without talking about the macroeconomic background. We got uh, the Bank of England just raised rates, the Fed is gonna raise rates. Some people think maybe three, four times. Uh, this year, what is the what's going on in the global economy and with monetary policy right now? 
mean for the people in this room? Are we headed towards hyperinflation? Uh, what do they need to know uh, as they, what does it mean for commodity? Well, we'll get into what it means for commodities in a second. But um, what, what do the people in the ro this room need to know about uh, the global economy and how it's going to affect them? So I'm a contrarian when it comes to that. Uh, you know, everyone, if we go back to 87, I've been privileged or un not so privileged to have been in a couple of these big crashes, 87, yeah. 99, 2007, 2000 and, and, and seven and eight. Yeah. And, and I just remind everyone we were going into 2019, everyone was worried about an everything bubble. And, um, and then we had COVID and suddenly, you know, sort of magically, everything's now booming and it's a new game and it's never going to stop and we've got you know uh, valuations in the markets that are just too high and and we've created so much risk and we've pumped in the, the again the developed world the wealthy countries have been able to support their citizens through this crisis but what have they done to the whole global economy so i think you know and and every you know and 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 the one thing about the federal reserve it's a, like any analyst. The one thing I've learned in my career, 30 years in the gold industry, don't believe a gold forecast. It doesn't <laughs> work. And, uh, and, and again, the, the, the Federal Reserve said inflation was transitory. It isn't. And the one thing we know is that when inflation arrives, it's too late. And it's very difficult to walk back. And politically, it means you've got to put people under stress because and we've got a world where money was free and now we're going to make it expensive. And what is that going to do to the global economy? So I think there's going to be a, a, a requirement for a more balanced outlook. And we've got to worry about the developing world because that's the engine in the global economy. The engine is not the printing press in New York or London or Europe. It's actually the developing world. We've got uh, Goldman Sachs saying that we might be, Jeff Curry saying that we might be at the beginning of, or we are at the beginning of a commodity super cycle. What's that mean for the minerals we're talking about here over the, the uh, I don't know, over the next decade? Are they going to be part of that? You know, I don't, uh, you know, th there's, there's, there's a, 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 a middle road in this. Uh, you know, super cycle is, is, a, is a definition, so what does it mean? Um, I think that we're in for a long, uh, solid uh, market demand for metals. Um, as if we're going to be uh, focused on, on a global solution for this world and very serious about our ESG commitments uh, to our citizens and our, the countries around the world. If we're going to look global, and I think that's another thing this conference brings is this is a genuine, it's, it's right at the middle of East meeting West, as the minister said, and it's a genuine embracing of the world. Whereas what we've witnessed in the last three years is a deglobalization rather than an embracement and a, and, a, and a desire to work together no matter what our, our social background is for the good of our planet, because that's what we've got to do. So that's what I'd say. Two quick questions. Uh, which of the minerals do you recognize will, or which mineral do you recognize, do you suspect is going to pose the greatest challenge for the mining industry going forward? Challenge in the form of supply or? Yes. So I, with, without a doubt, copper. Because, you know, we just don't, haven't invested. And I think uh, generally we've been behind as an industry in investing in, in, our, in the whole mining minerals business. Because actually this last couple of years with this obsession about the uh, environment and anti-mining is we've almost become embarrassed to be miners. And I think today listening to the minister and, and all the people here and all who are uh, um, logged in uh, um, from around the world, it's a time that we need to stand up and say, this planet cannot operate without us as miners. We need to be, do it in partnership and we need to do it responsibly. The biggest surprise, there we go.
And the biggest surprise that awaits the mining industry over the next 10 years? Uh, um, I, I, for me, it's, it's we, I think the biggest surprise that's already here is we aren't being honest about the technology we need to develop and the time we need to actually deliver on our promises. And I think that, and that can only happen in partnership with uh, politicians, governments, the whole of society. If we get together and work this out, we'll find the solution. If we don't and we allow people to exploit the, the situation, it will end up in a very bad place. And I think that needs courage for us to actually get out there and say, we don't have all the answers, we do have the motivation and the commitment to get there and we're gonna do it together. You've got operations around the world put, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, North and East Africa, and Central Asia in context. How much potential is there here? The potential is enormous, enormous, and it's unknown. You know, if you look at the, uh, the Andean trend, which produces most of the copper and many of the other metals, including lithium, uh, in the world today, and, uh, and you look at the Tethian mineral belt that stretches from Greece all the way to Malaysia, um, that's as prolific. It's a, has got a bigger or a, a, as much or bigger endowment as that caldera, caldera um, trend all the way up the west coast of the Americas. And I think, and sure there are challenges. Um, you know, a lot of uh, that uh, belt uh, crosses through challenging geopolitical uh, addresses. Yeah. But again, I think embracing uh, and, and with Saudi standing up and saying, we will open up this partnership and we're gonna help in unlocking this endowment. I think that's very important um, because, you know, and I think that's the future of mining and it's gonna be the courageous people who are prepared to take mining in, in a partnership way, in a responsible way, into these regions, which will change this part of the world, which has always been a challenge. Yeah, because, you know, geopolitically speaking, as you know, there's a trend to move away from those kind of jurisdictions. Yeah, that's what drives me crazy. You know, a lot of investors say, you got to, they, 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 they invest in global mining companies and then say, you've got to go to the safe jurisdictions vis-a-vis -vis the United States, Europe. That's not the place that needs mining. You know, we need to be where the, where the elephants are. You know, you need to go out there and, and, and find world-class deposits to support long-term mining. That's the most responsible way to exploit any resources to focus on the big ones. And zooming out a bit, the potential of the Arabian Nubian Shield, the Tetian Belt there. Uh, we're, we're talk well, to I you think the Tetian bit more about Belt that. is world-class, undeveloped, but world-class. The Arabian Nub Nubian Shield, again, you know, is, is such an interesting geological address, particularly the Arabian Shield. And I'll just give you an example. You can work all year round in the Arabian Shield the, uh, because there's no, there's no big snow weather. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a perfect place to go exploring for a geologist. And a lot of exposure. And it's only s been explored superficially. And I think, but there's a lot of data. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia through its SOEs have invested an enormous amount in collecting data. So there's a platform for discovery. And, and I think we can migrate that across the Red Sea to Egypt and, and the Nubian Shield, and then of course into Africa. Uh, and the Tethian, belt, uh, you know, I, I, we do not, I mean, as a geologist, it's a s absolutely serious uh, metal belt with all the metals and it's, it's developed over geological time. It's just 
for young people, if we can open that access, I mean, it's just such a fantastic new place to go exploring. You and it's not much less risky than the Andean belt today. As you know, in South America, there's a lot of dynamics, a lot of uh, uh, geopolitical risk. So, and my point is that at the end of the day, it's about how you mine and, and, and in what partnership that manages risk. There's risk everywhere. Well, thank you very mu much, Mark. And please join me in thanking Mark for that very insightful conversation. <laughs>